Inboard brakes are the best for a drift car, and here's why. To understand inboard brakes, we first have to look at the history of where they were used. They were used in F1 racing, sprint car, dirt track, go-karts, and many other applications. Some manufacturers even made them a standard option within their production cars. In F1, they're no longer used as brake technology improved. They were able to fit a larger brake inside of the wheel itself, but we do still see the inboard brake setup on sprint cars today and many other applications. So, why am I saying that they're the best for a drift car? We're gonna start with the benefits of inboard brakes. When you mount the brakes on the inside, basically beside the differential, it removes 12 to 20 pounds per wheel from the unsprung weight. By unsprung weight, I mean the weight that is connected to the tire and is not absorbed or controlled by the shock. Removing this weight from the wheel and putting it within the chassis now gives us that same amount of weight, but now it's being controlled on the chassis, which the shock is dampening. Also, the weight of the wheel is what the shock is required to control on bump. So now when we hit bumps, the only amount of inertia that's gonna be acting upon the suspension is the weight of the suspension itself and the weight of just the wheel itself. We won't have brakes, rotors, and calipers to add to that equation. The other benefit to inboard brake setups is the center of gravity. Mounting as much weight as possible to the center line of the gravity and as close to the center of the car as possible is the most beneficial way to build a efficient race car. So with that said, you take the same amount of weight that I was talking about unsprung, and we're now moving it towards the center of the car. This is going to give us way better roll center, better center of gravity, and better overall handling potential just by having this weight where it would be with an inboard brake setup. The other thing is the brake force dissipation is going to be the exact same as acceleration, but in reverse. So all of the brake forces are gonna go through the diff and through the chassis itself using the subframe, and everywhere that it's bolted to to actually slow the car down. I know what you're thinking, the wheel's connected to the axle, so the loads must be going through the axle. That's correct. That is the exact same path, but in reverse as accelerating. A huge benefit for drifting is that the brake calipers and the brake lines and the rotors are not on the wheel anymore. So in the event of an accident, you have almost nothing to deal with in terms of replacing and working around because those brake lines are contained within the chassis. Containing them within the chassis, especially if we are hitting a wall or a competitor who runs into us, we will not have to worry about anything to do with brake fluid, brake lines, and servicing because it's all taken care of and it's out of the way for damaging. The last point I'm gonna make for the benefit towards having inboard brake setups on a drift car is that we do not need heavy or powerful brakes in the rear of a drift car. The main purpose for them is hand braking and then we have a very slight amount of brake pressure whenever we're left foot braking or braking in general. If we do ever need to stop in a hurry, most drifters are gonna press the brake and pull the handbrake at the same time so that they can lock all four wheels with little to no effort. Going into that, I know you guys are gonna say the disadvantages. What are all the disadvantages? People talk about them all the time on our Instagram reels. Some of these reels were getting three, four, five, even six million views. It was pretty crazy. Every time we posted about them, somebody had something to say that was negative. And that unfortunately is the way that the world works, but it inspires conversation and it creates conflict where we are able to teach and learn and people feel obligated to comment and it just creates great discussion. So the downsides, obviously a lot of guys were saying a big downside is that you're going to have a bunch of heat from the brakes going into the diff, warming up the oil and doing all these problems. Yes, that is going to be a concern when you're talking about road racing, a major concern. But in drifting, we're doing 30 second to a minute long runs at any given time. And then we're right back in line waiting again for our next practice or our next battle or qualifying. And then the car is parked and sits for long periods of time. So although there are some instances where heat is going to be generated and that may dissipate a little bit into the diff, Realistically, it's such a minute problem that it's really not gonna cause any issues within drifting. If anything, the oil in the diff doesn't have an opportunity to warm up properly anyways. So if anything, it could even help, who knows. But as far as road racing goes, absolutely that is a problem. Heat extraction is gonna be a big thing in drifting, not so much. And I had a rad with two massive fans mounted directly behind the diff, pulling a bunch of fresh air right past it. So. Even in my situation, long amounts of driving, it wasn't gonna be an issue. Another downside is that mounting the brakes within the chassis isn't really that easy to do, especially if you have a unibody with a subframe. 
It was really only possible on the Corvette and may only be possible within a few other types of chassis. Otherwise, you can't really do it. You would have to modify the subframe, cut a bunch of pieces out of it. Like if I was to look at my 240, for example, absolutely not possible to do it there unless I heavily modified my subframe. So that's a major downside and gonna be the reason why most or nobody ever actually does it like I did for drifting. Another downside is that the serviceability becomes a little harder, not much in my Corvette. Honestly, it almost was easier because I could actually change the brake pads and the caliper without ever removing the wheel itself. I just open up the trunk, reach in over the back, and I can remove the calipers, remove the lines and the pads uh, without touching the wheels. So I would argue that it's almost easier, but it could be difficult to mount in other chassis, so that's why I put in that as a downside to inboard brakes. One more, I have one more that's important, and then you guys might be able to fill in a bunch of ideas that you have that are negatives. The last one would be if, in the event of braking in axle, Yes, you would lose brakes on the wheel that the axle broke. In drifting, as soon as you break an axle, you are absolutely done. Breaking an axle is actually more dangerous than most things because it basically drives the car completely straight as soon as that axle breaks. You have traction on the, on the tire that is not able to be driven anymore and it's gonna cause you to straighten heavily or go into a wall, really, is what's gonna happen. So, so think of it this way. Pulling is going to be easier than pushing. Because on acceleration, those axles are able to withstand the forces of pushing the vehicle forward, you have the entire weight of the vehicle in front of the pushing force, and the grip of the tire is pressing into the pavement harder and harder to increase grip and push that car forward. But when we pull the handbrake, all of the weight and momentum is in front of the rear tires. So when we pull the handbrake, it's gonna be around 30% of the forces on the axle that it was when we were accelerating. I hope that makes a lot of sense. It's a lot less force on the axles. Trust me when I say this, pulling the handbrake is never gonna break the axles. The only thing that really breaks axles that I see for most drivers is mistiming your handbrakes and clutch kicking to compensate for wheel speed that is super high and things like that. When you have 120 mile an hour wheel speed and you're only going 40 and you clutch kick, that's a ton of force on that axle significantly more than pulling the handbrake. Also, dragging a tire is going to be a lot less inertia than trying to drive a tire into pushing a car forward. Axles are never gonna break due to handbraking. They're gonna break due to other things, like accelerating, like I said. In the event of the handbrake scenario where I was saying people mistime a handbrake, clutch kick, and actually are not releasing the handbrake in time, and all that power goes through the caliper and the rotor, and then the axle's trying to drive that, that will break axles instantly. But with inboard brakes, it actually removes that as a possibility because the rotor and caliper are before the axle. So if you were to do that, it might be worse. It might break the output flange or your diff, but it won't break your axle. So if that's not a positive or a negative, I don't know what it is. Don't mistime your handbrakes. That's the main point of this because you're gonna break something if you do it too many times. All in all, we did the inboard brake setup because when I was looking at the car and I saw the amount of space beside the diff and the frame rails, I said, we're putting inboard brakes on the car. And everyone in the shop was like, come on, you got, you're doing an eight to one, you got enough crazy things going on, you're moving the rack, you're doing all these things that no one's ever done on a Corvette, why are you doing inboard brakes as well? And I said, because I can and because it's going to allow us to design new top hats, machine them in-house, make content around it, and see if it works. And a lot of people said that it either wouldn't work or there would be so many issues. Guys, it worked amazing. The only reason I took it off was because I wanted a dual caliper setup. I like having the handbrake brake system separate from my foot braking system. I hate it when I have any sort of feedback through my brake pedal whenever I'm using my handbrake, and I use both at the same time quite often. For me to have four calipers on the diff, um, it might actually be done still. Uh, basically, the, where the caliper was on our bracket, there wasn't enough room to put another one in front of it. But really, all I would need to do is just go back to the computer, design a new bracket, maybe, maybe get the calipers a little closer together, maybe rotate them a little far forward, and then I would be able to fit four in the middle. And the great thing about that is I could have short little flex lines or hard lines going to the calipers, and then be back to where I was with nearly 20 pounds of unsprung weight moved from the wheel to the chassis 
and really that shock doesn't need to work very hard on bump. It is going to be able to control the weight of the suspension and wheel and tire no problem. For us it was beneficial to do that because we moved the shock so far in as well that the motion ratio was to the point where it could use less weight on the wheel to control the suspension better and all in all, it's, it's a beneficial solution if it works well and if you're able to make it happen within your chassis. So thank you guys for watching this video. The important thing to note is that this is for drifting. It is better for drifting. If you are doing road racing and you have a Corvette and you watch our videos, don't put it on your diff. It's not going to be better um, for the reasons I explained. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys in the next video. Hope you guys like the green screen because it takes a lot longer to set up. Loxley, thanks for your pointers. Jack's killing it. We need a lot more lights, apparently, but appreciate it, buddy. See you on the next one. Bye.